Uh, most of you, I think, know me, but for those who don't, my name is Zach Can. Uh, I'm a missionary of Grace Bible Church sent to Papua New Guinea. Uh, I work there along with our coworkers, Ryan and Elna Mitchell. I'm there with my wife, Cassidy, our boys, Jude and Oliver, and going back with our new daughter, Annie Rose. So we're really excited about that. Uh, Grace Bible Church is part of a pretty spectacular mission. Uh, it's a mission to reach, to, to plant churches among some of the most unreached peoples in the world, some of the most remotest groups of people on the planet. Uh, Jeremy Lehman last week spoke of some of what's involved in the mission to Papua New Guinea during last week's equipping hour, and this week I'm going to do the same. I'm just going to share with you another slice of what it takes to do that mission, specifically in relation to translation. This morning, really, I have two desires. There's going to be a lot of talk of Bible translation and a lot of technical details. Smed gave me permission to overwhelm you with details this morning, just so that you can know how to pray. And one of my desires is, no matter if you understand a third of what I say, and you just feel overwhelmed by the magnitude of the, of the project in front of me, uh, hopefully that'll just lead you to pray for me, and this talk will have served its purpose. Uh, my other desire this morning is that as I talk about the wonders of Bible translation, the glory of God's word, that it would help you worship the Lord as you hold a copy of God's word translated on your lap. You hold a copy of God's word. God has communicated and you have access to it in your own language. I hope that this time of looking at Bible translation will help you, encourage you to slow down sometimes as you read, to ask good questions, uh, to find out more of the depth, more of the truth, more of the hope, more of the joy that is found in the scriptures. Uh, these are lofty, lofty goals, so join me in prayer as we ask the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, thank you that we have your word. God, that is a wonderful thing. We want to know you. Um, who else is worth knowing besides you? God, you are the creator of everything. God, you are holy and other. You are the only one not created. God, you sustain all things. Everything is upheld by the word of your power. And God, we are just creatures here today and gone tomorrow. God, what a joy that we have your word in our language. God, we think of the people who do not have your word in their language, who do not yet know the good news that there is a rescuer. God, would you raise up many servants? God, I thank you for those who have been sent out from this church to bring the good news to other people in other places. God, thank you for the church plant in Gilbert. Thank you for the teams that are thinking of going to New Orleans and doing a church plant there. God, thank you for um, the Malikas in Italy. God, thank you for Wayman Lee and his work in Africa and, and around the globe, really, just helping pastors to handle your word well. God, thank you for those that you've sent to Papua New Guinea, those that you're going to send to Papua New Guinea, maybe even more from this body here. God, would you just make your name great among the nations, we pray. Amen. So as we get started, uh, you need to know that I am by no means an expert in Bible translation. I know I uh, put the title Translating Ephesians up there, uh, but I'm just starting. Ephesians is the very first book of the New Testament that I am beginning to work through as I go about translation. So this, this next hour is really about um, me trying to communicate to you lessons that I've learned. Uh, as I've gone through translation. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Bible translation from someone who has actually done it long-term and accomplished a lot in Bible translation, I can commend to you a book. Uh, it's called Understanding Bible Translation by William Barrick. Um, and it's, it's pretty accessible for a book of this type. Uh, at least the first half is. Um, and this is a lot of what I'm going to say, a lot of the the insights that I've had into Bible translation, a lot of it comes from reading this book. So I, if, if translation is something that interests you, uh, that's a good book to pick up. 
But this morning, I just want to share with you some things I've learned from the task of translation. So some convictions that keep me hopeful and some conundrums that keep me humble. So convictions, these are truths that I just hold to when I face the daunting work of Bible translation. And conundrums are just those challenges that come from trying to bring one language into another. And anyone who's used Google Translate or something like that knows that it's not a simple process. So here we go. We'll start with the convictions. Number one, God is the creator of every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is a really comforting truth to know that all language ultimately belongs to God. He's the one who made mouths and teeth and tongues and vocal cords and lungs and brains to put all that together to make sounds that somehow communicate meaning to people who are listening. He created ears so that people could hear. It's, it's amazing, and it's all from him. And in the beginning, in Genesis 1, there was one language, just one. And from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11, that's nearly 2,000 years of human history. There was only one language. And then comes Genesis 11, where God confuses the languages of the earth. There was only one language and the people were rebelling against God. God told them to fill the earth. They weren't doing that. They were gathering together, building a tower, trying to make their name great, trying to accomplish great things on their own. And uh, let me just read it to you. It's great what God does here. They're trying to make a great name for themselves and Yahweh has to come down to see the city and the tower which they are creating. And Yahweh said, behold, they are one people. They all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. So come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the whole earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because Yahweh confused the languages of the whole earth. We don't know how many languages Yahweh created in that day, but we do know that there are about 7,100 languages spoken in the world today. God did this as an act of judgment since mankind was continuing to rebel against him. He also did so out of mercy, knowing that this would slow down mankind in what their evil hearts could accomplish. And, and what's amazing is God knew how to create the confusion that was necessary. He knew how to keep people from understanding one another. He did not just change their vocabulary. He didn't just give people new sets of vocabulary. You call a cabbage this, all right, this guy's going to call a cabbage that. It's not that simple. He changed minds and mouths. He changed ways of thinking. He changed accents. Anyone who has studied another language knows how complicated it is to learn another language. Our God is amazing. He's the source of all our communication and our communication woes. Knowing this is a huge encouragement in Bible translation. When I think of the need to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, the, the myriad of languages out there seems like a barrier, seems like a hurdle to be overcome. And it's just so encouraging to know that that barrier, that hurdle was put there by God Almighty. He knows it's there. And so when he gives the command to go make disciples in all nations, yes, it's a hard task, even an impossible one, but the God of the impossible goes with those that are sent to accomplish this work. He's the one who designed that problem to begin with. He can help us find a solution. And spoiler alert, in the end, God gets all the glory from every tribe, tongue, and nation. In the end, he does not eradicate all language and culture. He redeems people from every family of the earth, and he will be praised in every language. Just read Revelation 5, 9, and 10. To show you a small picture, I'm going to illustrate now, to show you a small picture of how amazing this is, let me share with you some amazing 
details about one of those 7,100 languages, the Doe language. The Doe language has about 24 unique sounds that are perceived by native speakers. And we wrote the alphabet, so there are actually 24 letters in their alphabet. We, in English, have 26 letters, as you know, but sounds, there's actually 44 unique sounds in English. So do, in that sense, is a lot simpler. Interestingly, they can't perceive uh, a lot of different sounds, uh, at least not in spoken language. The difference between an R and an L sound the same to them, F and P. And this is fun because in our village, we actually have a guy whose name is Lupa, and I can call him Lupa or Rupa, and he does not hear the difference. He just responds to both. Uh, this means that Doe people would have a hard time hearing the difference between the English words tall and tar, because the only difference between those is L and R. Contrast that with Doe, which has complications of its own. Uh, they've got words like uh, kene, kene, and kene. Those are all different. Those are all letters that sound like the English K to us, but those are actually very different words. Kene means uh, my trail or my road. Kene means my leg, and kene means look. Oh, I guess I have my knee up there. My knee, my leg. This whole thing is just your kene. So um, the Do language has words that are singular, dual, and plural. So singular if you want to talk to one person, dual if you want to talk to two people, or plural if you want to talk to three or more. Uh, it's something we don't have in English. So pronouns might look like this. If I'm talking to one person, I would say keto, that's you. Two people, yarindo, that's two of you. Yendo, that's you all, three or more. Uh, it shows up in nouns. They've got uh, three different uh, well, lots of different. Here's three examples. Ye pasa, ye wasa, ye nasa. Uh, just different pairs that are common in their culture. Two siblings together. Uh, a dad with his child. A mom with her child. Do verbs are very different than English verbs. Uh, these are words of action, right? The, uh, they tend to be longer in do because there's more information contained in them. So, for example, in the English sentence, uh, oh, I forgot to mention the verbs. Yes. Uh, there's, so here there's verbs. This, this just shows that it can be uh, singular, dual, or plural again. You can do tongarong he left, tongariyong, or tonganguring. And then in the next slide, it shows that uh, do verbs can be longer. So here, if you wanted to say, uh, if you wanted to ask, can, can you two wash these things? In, in do, you can do that with one verb. It's sono wo we aripe. I had to practice that. I'm a little rusty. Sono we aripe. So sono wo is their word for to wash. Weya gives you the future tense. Ari tells you you're talking to two people. And pe makes it the question. Add to all this that they don't um, add all the information to every verb when they're telling a story. In any given sentence, they only use the full form of the verb, the really long form, at the very end of a sentence. In the middle of a story, all the verbs that are in the middle, they have special endings that tell the listener that the story is still continuing. For example, here's a story from one of my Doe-speaking friends in the village. He was telling a story of how we we're on a really long hike and we were just coming back into the village. So we're going up and down these really steep slopes. Uh, and, and here's a short clip of the story that he told me. He said, Nore umbu are yendemo are toko, kasiriko kopi kambu nunoni nero metengo iso yero, ke kutingomo kotororo, korotoro, asa nore kutinganimo utobo. And if I back translate that into English, what, what you'll see is that there are eight verbs in this small story. I've, I've highlighted them in, in yellow for you. There's eight verbs, but only the last one is in past tense. The rest of the verbs are lightly tagged with information needed to keep the story going. And so I'm going to try to show it to you. And, 
Everything in English that's in yellow, that is the information that is contained in those verbs. So if I translated it roughly back, it would sound like this. We come down, come up, talking about all the slopes, to the village come first, then Cassidy, and there's a mark at the end of Cassidy's name which tells the listener, I'm introducing a new character into this story. Cassidy, coffee, a lot of it gives us. And that gives us is the last verb that pertains to Cassidy. So it is a special ending on it. It's the word nunoni up there, nunoni nero. Nunoni has an ni at the end of it, which means we're switching subjects back to the previous subject that was before Cassidy was introduced. Cassidy, uh, uh, coffee, a lot of it gives us drink, happy, thank you, say. You at your house leave you, all right, we do our houses, went. There you go, your translated verb right there, uh, or conjugated verb right there at the end. It's pretty complicated, isn't it? The Doe people are remarkable storytellers, and this language is actually built for storytelling, which is really cool when you consider that the Bible contains a lot of narrative, a lot of stories. Um, it is just such a blessing. Such a, it's like a, a, witnessing a miracle to be able to translate these stories uh, into their language. Doe is a wonderfully complex language. Um, it's one of uh, over 800 in Papua New Guinea. So, this, I mean, we're only doing one of these languages, you guys. We need other people to go to, to do this work. But God being in charge of language, culture, tribes, people, that's, that's conviction number one. Conviction number two is that this God who created language um, wrote a book. He wrote a book. He authored a book. God is the author of the Bible. And some of these convictions, especially here at Grace Bible Church, may seem really obvious. And if it does seem obvious to you, then praise the Lord. Because these convictions are not obvious to the rest of the world. And the more I labor at the task of preaching and teaching, the more I labor at the task of translation, the more I love these simple truths. God is the author of the Bible. I love 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16 and following. All scripture is God-breathed. It's God-breathed. It's profitable that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work, including the work of Bible translation. God being the author of a book is a, is a huge encouragement. 2 Peter 1 is one of my favorite chapters in, uh, in the Bible talking about the Bible itself. I think it's a great invitation to read your Bibles. Um, I, and actually, I don't know, am I preaching next week? Sunday night? Yes. All right. I'm not going to talk about 2 Peter 1 now. You can come back next week at night service. We'll talk about 2 Peter chapter 1 together. But God being the author of a book is a huge encouragement to me as a translator. For starters, it's nice to know what to translate. There are a lot of books out there. I mean, have any of you been in Smed's office? It is just floor to ceiling. Like, I don't know, how tall are your ceilings? 20 feet high? of just books, just books. So great that I do not have to translate all those books in order to make people complete in Christ. They need the word. They need the word. I need to give the dough people as much of God's counsel as he will give me days to translate. The dough people need to hear from him. They don't ultimately need to hear from me or another pastor, John Calvin, Augustine, they need to hear from God. Commentaries can be helpful, but they are not ultimately needful. What is needful is God's word. So let me show you now how this conviction impacts translation. If God's the author of a book, uh, then that book is what I want to translate for people. And when I'm done... Whenever that is, I want to be able to say, this is God's word in your language. It is authoritative, it is sufficient, it is clear, and it is profitable to study. What I don't want 
is to hand them my commentary on God's word. I want to hand them God's word. So this leads to a smaller, more technical conviction. So the big conviction is God is the author of the Bible. The smaller conviction is more technical, and it's I want to make sure that I have accounted for every detail in the Bible, to be very, very clear and to be careful about any additions that I make, if any are necessary for clarity. And that task is not easy. To illustrate this, uh, consider two different drafts of a passage that I was recently working on in Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. This is like where we are in our mornings with Smed and John, going through Ephesians, checking the translation. We're like right here. So here's two different drafts, rough drafts, not completed. Uh, I think I've got them up there for you. I do. So if you look at the English for option one, it's, but now this is uh, Ephesians 2 verse 13. If you want to compare it to your English. But now God washed you far away ones with Christ's blood and brought you to Jesus's side so that now you've come and are close. That's option one. Here's another option that we came up with. And again, this is just working with language. Doe has limitations on what it can say. So another option, before you were not near to God, but now Christ shed his own blood and brought you near to God. So these are some options. Let's, let's think about these now. Uh, in, in the original, you've got this phrase, but now, he's contrasting what he was saying before in the previous verses. And those can be seen in both options. So check, we got some details there. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. But now in Christ, that in Christ is really difficult to translate. Uh, in, in, the fir- in option one, it's translated with the phrase brought to Jesus' side. You're in his camp. You're in his family. You're inside the work that he accomplished at the cross. Uh, In the second one, it's uh, pretty much absent, that in Christ. It's hard because you have in Christ and you have brought near by the blood of Jesus. Two different phrases with different nuances and meanings. They're they're there for a reason. It's not just uh, repetition for repetition's sake. So these things have to be dealt with. Uh, Interestingly, in option one, you know, and this is just me translating, in option one, uh, the one bringing us uh, near is God. God's the one bringing us near in in the first option. Um, And it's Jesus in the second. So Jesus is the one who brings us near to God in the second. God is the one who brings us near in the first. The reason for this is that It just says, you who were once far off have been brought near. Well, have been brought near by whom? By who? Who who did that? Uh, The text might not always make it clear, and that just forces me as a translator to have to make a decision because they don't have passive tense. You can't say, you have been brought near. You have to say, someone brought you near. And so I have to figure out who that someone is and translate it. In showing you this, I'm starting to introduce some of the dilemmas and conundrums. Uh, But I think it's good to see that these convictions, as clear as they are, do not necessarily make translation easy. They just help the goal stay clear when the road is foggy. So let's keep going with the convictions. Conviction number three, God means what he says. God means what he says. I, I have up there Mark 7. 6 to 13, and Hebrews 3 to 4. The Hebrews, what I have in mind there is, God's just saying, as he, he commands people, as long as it's called today, repent, turn, heed, listen to God. Heed his word. There's salvation offered. You, you're expected to listen and to understand what God says. There is a way to be saved. Um, but the, the best example I... Uh, I thought about this was actually when John preached Mark 7 last week. I thought it was an an excellent example of God meaning what he says. 
So first of all, Jesus confronts the Pharisees' departure from God's law by saying, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you? Well, this means that the original prophecy had meaning and could be meaningfully applied to those who twist Scripture to their own advantage. And then Jesus says that these Pharisees have left the commandment of God in verse 8, rejected the commandment of God in verse 9, and made void the word of God in verse 10. He does not say, oh, whoops, you guys tried and you misunderstood the word. He says, God spoke clearly, and you went ahead and abandoned it, rejected it, made your own traditions, and then emptied God's word completely by replacing it with your own. God's commands were clear. He spoke clearly. He meant what he said. And humans muddied to that clarity with their own thoughts and traditions on how things should be done. From this, I am convinced that God is a good communicator. God expects to be understood and heeded. And this leads me to a conviction that is perhaps not too widely held among translators. And that is that any given passage of Scripture means one thing. It cannot mean many things or different things to different people. There is absolute truth to be had in every word and clause and phrase and sentence and paragraph. There's truth to be had, and it's the translator's job to get at that truth. So here we go again. How does this conviction play itself out? When I read Ephesians 2.11, I know that God's word means something. And my job is to communicate that meaning clearly and accurately in another language. And if you look at Ephesians 2, verse 11, the meaning of it, especially if you have an ESV or an NASB, might not be immediately clear. This probably happens in Bible reading a bit for you, does for me, where you read something and you're like, what in the world does that mean? Here's what Ephesians 2, 11 says. Uh, I'm reading from the ESV. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. What does that mean? That's crazy. How do you get at it? That means something. It means something. So we take our time. We figure it out. For for fun, let's consider a variety of translations of Ephesians 2.11 and think through some of the pros and cons of the translation. I've got four of them up on the screen for you. Uh, The first is my own clunky translation of Ephesians 2.11, translated from Greek to English. Therefore, remember that formerly you Gentiles in the flesh, the ones called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision that is made, that is man-made in the flesh. Um, The second... One up there is the New Living Translation, the NLT, which offers a bit more interpretation in its translation. It reads, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. And the third is from the message, which avoids the issue of circumcision altogether and offers kind of what the translator hopes is a big picture summary of the verse. Verse 11 reads, But don't take any of this for granted. It was only yesterday that you were outsiders to God's ways. And then lastly, here's one of my attempts at translating this into dough. And keep in mind that I am the same person who translated the first one, the top one. And I can't just say, those words in dough, the way they are there. I have to figure out a way to say, to communicate what's being said there in dough. So here's my attempt. Because of all that, think this again. Some of you are not Jews, but other people. The Jews cut their skin with their hands, and they call you the ones who do not cut their skin. So I definitely win for turning what is only a fragment of a sentence in the Greek into what is essentially three sentences. So I, uh, but even though I have more sentences, it's amazing that there are still elements of the Greek that are not accounted for in 
my translation. Only the original, uh, the, the first one, and the second one, the NLT, captured the idea of Jews calling themselves circumcised and what's going on there. The NLT is trying to show that perhaps it was pride that the Jews had in their lineage, how they looked down on other nations for not being circumcised, for not having the promises, for being outsiders. And on the one hand, that is probably the reality. Many Jews looked down on foreigners. But on the other hand, the words heathen, proud, and the phrase affecting not their hearts, those aren't in the original. Those have been added to try to help clarity. Uh, and it might, but this might make it hard in future study of the Bible when people are searching for verses on pride or the human heart or does anyone in the Bible ever call anyone a heathen? This verse is going to pop up, even though it wasn't necessarily what was communicated in the original. So there's things to think through there. The message uh, would be a hard one to study for similar reasons. Uh, most of the words, most of the clauses in the original have been completely replaced with others. I think the, the translator of the message does hit some key ideas when he uses the idea of being outsiders. I think that's there. But it misses entirely the divide that's occurring between Jew and Gentile, as well as completely ignoring the religious rite of circumcision, which can be found all throughout the Bible. So you see, this is complicated. There are deep, wonderful insights to draw out of every clause, every sentence, every paragraph, every book of the Bible. Um, and the translator has to be careful to communicate those words, those clauses, those phrases, those sentences, those paragraphs well, so that people can start to draw from it. And the drawing from it, the giving the deep, beautiful insights, the, the helping explain the text, that is the work of preaching, which actually leads me to my next conviction. Number four, God commands that his word be preached. God commands that his word be preached. You can hear it in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. And then after establishing that authority, he says, go, make disciples of all nations, doing two things, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Teaching is a part of the Great Commission. In Romans 10, after Paul explains that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, what about those who haven't heard that that's the case? His solution is put into a question. How will they hear without a preacher? And how will those preachers preach unless they are sent? And of course, Paul tells his young disciple Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2, Timothy, preach the word. The word gives the preacher something to preach, something to say. The preacher doesn't have anything to say on his own. He needs God's word. The preacher is not above God's word. He doesn't get to decide what it means. He has no power over its interpretation. And yet God has commanded that there be those who can accur accurately handle God's word and preach it to others. This conviction is also a huge encouragement to me as a translator because what a relief that my translation does not have to do the preaching. I don't have to fit all the information into every single passage. I don't need each individual passage of scripture to give the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God does that. Each verse just needs to say what each verse says. That's my job. So if, if you have your Bibles open to Ephesians 2 still, um, in verse 12, when Paul writes about Gentiles lacking the Messiah, being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, or the citizenship of Israel, being strangers to the covenants 
of the promise. That's covenants, plural, of the promise, singular. Interesting. And being without God in the world, when, when you read that, that's a lot of, those are all heavy concepts that are spoken of throughout the Bible. I don't need this verse to say all that can be said about Gentiles or the Messiah or citizenship in Israel or the covenants of the promise. I don't need it to say all that can be said about those things. I just need to make sure that the translation communicates that those things are there in a way that is clear to a listener and accurate to the text. Because of this, I, I have another, this is like a sub conviction to this fourth one. Um, I'm okay if the meaning of a particular text is not immediately clear on a first reading. I mean, how many of us understand every verse we read the first time we come across it? I mean, not even your pastors do that. I guarantee you, when John was preparing to preach today from Mark, he was reading his Bible and was just in awe of new things. Am I right? Yeah? It's okay if a translation is not immediately clear on a first reading. Welcome to the club. I mean, Peter said there were things in Paul's writings that are hard to understand. Peter, an apostle, reads Paul's letters and says, some of these things are hard to understand. But the goal is to think over what Paul says. Keep reading the word. Ask the Lord to help us understand and heed his word. Peter says right after that, that it is the ignorant and the unstable who will twist Paul's words because they're hard to understand. They'll twist Paul's words. They'll twist the other scriptures to their own destruction. And there are people who will do that. And that leads me to the last conviction that we'll look at this morning. And that is that God is the gatekeeper of understanding. If you're going to translate the Bible, you just have to believe that God is the gatekeeper of understanding, that he is the one who can help people see or not see the truth. Paul told Timothy to think over what he was saying in his letters and then reminded him that God would give him understanding. Think over what I say, Timothy, and God will give you understanding. This command was designed to keep Timothy hardworking and humble. Think, do the hard work of thinking, read, slow down, study, ask questions, and ask the Lord for help that you would have eyes to see and ears to hear the truth. Even the clearest translation of the Bible or the best articulation of the gospel may not be understood by all who read it or listen to it. Let me just give you an example of this from the Bible. Uh, last week, I was listening to Jeremy Lehman and Scott Maxwell talk about Paul's first missionary journey in Lystra. Uh, they were talking as Jeremy was preparing his equipping hour, and I was just stealing information. Uh, their insights were so fitting to this conviction uh, that I'm just going to steal their thoughts and share them with you now. So these are not mine. This is just so cool. In Acts 14, in Acts 14, starting in, in verse 5, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of it, but if you turn there, I'll, I'll point out some, some things as we go through the story. In Acts 14, verse 5, uh, Paul and Barnabas are fleeing persecution in Iconium, and they flee to Lystra and Derbe, and these are described as cities of Lyconia, and there they continued to preach the gospel. So they're in a region that speaks a different language, probably. Lyconia is the region, Lyconian is the language, as we'll see later. They're in a region that speaks a different language from the region they just left. Paul and Barnabas probably don't speak Lyconian. We'll see this when we get to verse 14. Um, so they are most likely speaking in the common language of the day, the trade language, uh, Greek, Koine Greek. But a massive misunderstanding ensues in Lystra. 
Paul heals a man crippled from birth. And then in verse 11 of chapter 14, it says, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in Lyconians, this is in their own language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Now this is the wrong interpretation of what's happening. And Paul and Barnabas eventually figure out what's going on. Verse 14, when Paul Oh, when the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments, they rushed out in the crowd, crying out, men, why are you doing these things? And they proceed to explain what is actually happening, the right interpretation. And then verse 18, even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. So they're speaking Greek as best they can, trying to communicate the gospel to these Lyconian people. And they are just scarcely able to convince them. Look at verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, that region that Paul left to come to this new region. And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. These Jews are not coming from Lyconian cities. And so I think it's safe to say that they probably don't know Lyconian either, or certainly not well. But even though Paul and Barnabas were barely able to keep these people from offering sacrifices to them, it seems that the Jews had no trouble convincing the same people to stone Paul. The reality is, is that this crowd was probably more ready to agree with fellow idolaters than they were with servants of the living God. It probably wasn't that Paul and Barnabas were speaking unclearly. The people just eventually heard things that resonated what was going on in their wicked hearts. At one point, they're ready to sacrifice to them. Paul says, no. These people come, they say, stone them. And they're like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. They're just ready to be misled. But it's not true of everyone. When you, when you look down in the next verses, uh, but when the disciples gathered around Paul, he rose up, entered the city. When they had preached the gospel to uh, and, and they went to Derby when they preached the gospel in that city, had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them. And verse 23 at the end says, they committed these disciples to the Lord in whom they had believed. There were some who did believe. God opened the eyes of some. He is in charge of understanding Brothers and sisters, we have to be praying in whatever task God has given us to do. Pray that our team would translate God's word clearly and pray that people would have ears to hear it and believe. All right, that's it for the convictions. That's not it for the convictions. That's all I'm going to share with you today. Let's turn to some conundrums as we finish up here. Conundrums that keep the translator humble. So in this process of wanting to be clear, wanting to give people God's word, wanting to translate things accurately, account for every word, every phrase, every sentence, every paragraph, every thought, but not go beyond that. In attempting to do that, there are just challenges in language. Um, the first conundrum is realizing my own limitations. Uh, I realize them all the time. Like when we read uh, Ephesians 2.11, I read that and I just scratch my head. I'm supposed to translate that? I barely know what that means. That's a limitation. I've encountered so many passages that are hard to understand because of my own lack of understanding. Uh, in in Barrick's book on Bible translation that I mentioned earlier, he says it it's an intimidating task to start Bible translation. You quickly realize that you need to know about a lot of different fields of science. You need to know about medicine and trees, and you need to know biology, zoology, gemology, all these ologies that are contained in the Bible, that the Bible speaks accurately to. And here I am, I don't know the first thing about most of the names of the places and the things that, I mean, people still don't really know what gopher wood is that the ark was made out of. Uh, there's, there's lots to figure out 
and it's a, it's a humbling position to be in. There are languages to learn, customs to investigate, arguments to follow, and there's only so much time in the day. And I am one of a handful of people who can speak the Doe language outside of the native population. It's a big task. Look again at uh, Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Highlight some, some of these challenges. When you read, you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision in the flesh, made with human hands. Those are all English words. There's no dough words in there. There's no Greek words in there. Those are English words. But there is so much in there to be unpacked and explored. There are hard things to understand in the Bible. And I have found that there's a lot of hard work to be done as I rely on the Lord to provide the understanding and insight that I need. I need the Lord's help. In the midst of translation, people knock on our door needing help or the internet goes out, or Jude falls off his bike and breaks his jaw and we have to come home. A lot of limitations, a lot of opportunity to trust the Lord. It's one of the conundrums that has to be faced. Another one is trying to be both clear and accurate in translation. Um, there, there are times when a translation does not communicate, though it seems like all the words are in the right order. Sometimes I translate and I'm convinced. First of all, I'm astounded that there are no English words in my translation. It's all dough and I'm so proud of myself. They're all dough words. And I'm like, this has got to communicate. And then I carry that translation to my translation helper in the village and I read it to him and I can just see on his face. He's like, I'm really trying to understand you, buddy. You know, he hears it and he's like, those are all dough words, but he, he doesn't even have the slightest clue is what I am talking about. Um, it's, it's complicated. Um, yeah, if, if you've traveled uh, overseas and seen signs in English written by people who speak English as a second or third or fourth language, sometimes you can guess what people are trying to say even though... Uh, <laughs> Every word's in English, but the communication is not accurate. So here's an example of someone who's trying to say, watch out, there's work in progress here. Something's being accomplished. But the English word they reach for is not the right one. I guess you can say execute a task, but execution is in progress, just communicate something completely different. That's funny, but it happens all the time. There are times when my translation is clear, but it communicates the wrong thing. Uh, when I was translating Ephesians 2.1, I translated it this way. So if he, uh, Ephesians 2.1, if you look at it, it says, um, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Right? We like this verse. Here's how I translated it. And you were like a dead person because you were breaking God's talk and you were sinning. And I checked with my language helper after I did that. I checked with my language helper to make sure I had accounted. Or I, I just checked with the Greek to make sure I had accounted for all the words. I'm like, yeah, all the words seem to be there. It's a decent attempt. I checked the sentence with my language helper and he seemed to think that it made sense. Yeah, we, we were like dead people because we were sinning and breaking God's talk. Yes, like that, that fits within his understanding. He's like, yeah, that makes sense. So then I come back to the States and I'm working through Ephesians, my translation decisions with Smed and John. And I'm just reading this back translation to them. And John's so gracious. He turns to me and says, but doesn't it say the opposite? And I was thinking, what? He's like, we're not dead because we sin. We sin because we're spiritually dead. And sure enough, reading the context, 
Paul calls his audience former sons of disobedience. By nature, children of wrath. We sin because we're spiritually dead. The spiritual deadness comes first. The sinning doesn't cause that death. And my translation said, you were like a dead person because you were breaking God's talk. When in fact, the logic that Paul is making there is the opposite. You guys, these things happen all the time. Being clear and accurate is tough. Being clear and accurate is tough. All right, we'll end with this conundrum. Uh, Dealing with different forms in language. Uh, This is a long one. And and I'm just going to rattle these off. Uh, Language rarely has... Languages rarely have words and grammatical structures that match other languages perfectly. Uh, It happens, but it's rare. Uh, Do is not like English. Do is not like Greek. Uh, They have different forms of argumentation. Uh, So actually, in Do, there is no easy way um, to say because, the word because. I know I just said because in the previous translation, but that was the best way I could back translate it. There's no real easy way to say the word because. They can say the word therefore, but because is often used when you put the cause of something at the end of a sentence, and logically, they almost always in do put the cause first. Cause, then effect, right? Um, So you've got this cause, and that results in this effect. Um, because allow, in English allows you to put the cause second in the sentence. Oh, I was late because there was traffic. In do, I would have to say, there was traffic, I am late. And there would be a special ending in there that would help you know, oh, that there was traffic uh, produced my lateness. Of course, I couldn't say that in do because they don't have traffic, so what am I even talking about? <laughs> Um, uh, I mentioned this before in verse 13. I can't say you were brought near by the blood of Christ, but rather the blood of Christ brought you near. Um, Not always a big deal, um, but sometimes it creates conundrums when Paul, like when Paul prays in Ephesians, that you be filled with the fullness of God. My translation will have to say someone Paul is praying that someone might fill you with the fullness of God. And I don't, I don't have passives, so I can't say you be filled. I have to say someone filled you. Um, so who is that someone? These are decisions that have to be made. Doe has very few, almost no abstract nouns. If you don't know what an abstract noun is, a noun is a person, place, or thing, right? So I could say podium, that's a noun. And it's a concrete noun. It's a it's not abstract. It, you can see it. I can point to it. I can say, what is this? And people can give me the word for podium. Uh, an abstract noun is something that you can't point to. It's not concrete. So ideas like love. You can't point at love and ask, what is this? It's, it's abstract. It's an idea. Trust, faith, belief, righteousness. Doe does not have hardly any of these words. Do has no word to describe love, no word to describe trust, no word to describe righteousness, no word to describe holiness, no word to describe kindness, no word to describe faith, no word to describe belief, no word for grace, no word for mercy. And that's just the beginning of my list, which means at this point, I have three options. Uh, Invent a word, you know, gobbledygook, you know, there's a word, now let's now let's put meaning to that word. Uh, we could create a word. That's, that's one option. Uh, borrow a word from another language. You know, in, in Papua New Guinea, you've got uh, Melanesian pidgin. You've got other nearby native languages. Uh, I, we could borrow from English. We could borrow from Greek. Uh, we could borrow from Latin. I mean, it doesn't matter. You just find a word that they can pronounce and start to give that word meaning. Start defining it for them. That's another option. Uh, A third option is that you can create a phrase. 
Um, if they don't have a word for love, you can say something like, well, it's when you're thinking really strongly about someone, or it's when you feel that belly pain that you guys talk about, like you really care about someone. That's, that's love. You can create a phrase to explain it. But no matter which of those options you choose, create a word, borrow a word, come up with a phrase, um, you have to define it. I have to start the hard work of defining that term or phrase so that people can understand what God means when he says that word or phrase. Uh, Doe does not have corresponding prepositions. This is another uh, language problem. Prepos English prepositions like in, with, on, below, next to, by, through, to, from, etc. don't have one-for-one -one corresponding prepositions in Doe. Uh, one phrase that has eluded me is this idea of being in Christ. In Christ shows up a lot in the book of Ephesians. In Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? I mean, have you ever wondered what the Bible means when it says in Christ? Uh, it shows up in Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near. So what does in Christ mean? It's common language in the Bible. It's in, we say it in our churches. We say we're in Christ. Um, but this is one of those things where I just have to stop and consider, what does that actually mean? Um, is it like being with Christ? I have a way to say that in dough. We, we're with Christ. Is it being inside of Christ, like you're inside of a house? They've got a word for that. Um, is it like being under Christ in some way or associated with Christ? Um, and after, I, I didn't have the answer to this, and so I came back, and we're, uh, Smed, John, and I are talking about this, um, and we, uh, I don't remember who it was, but we came up with this illustration. Um, being in Christ is kind of like being in the, we, we don't say in people very often. Um, in Christ might be a unique thing in that regard, but we do say things like being in the army or in a family. Um, when you are in a family or in the army, you're, you're under its rules and regulations. You enjoy its privileges and benefits. You identify with its values and mission. And you are in the army or in a family even when you're not physically with them. You're still in them. So after I get that, now I go, all right, now how do I say that in dough? And I still don't know. Part of the problem of doing this here is that I don't have a dough speaker to go check with. You know, I, I don't know dough well enough, so now I'm armed with examples and ideas to go back and test these ideas to try to find better ways to say these things. Um, and then there's just all the foreign concepts that tribal people have never encountered. Uh, what's, what's a Jew? What's a Gentile? What's circumcision? Our village doesn't know. They are going to need to be taught by our team patiently and carefully what these things mean. And in saying all of this and showing you some of the conundrums, I'm only scratching the surface of the conundrums our team has faced in the translation process. Translation is an impossible task without the Lord. We need his help. Uh, translation is um, complicated and complex. But then I was thinking, you know what? So is being a mom. So is parenting. Moms and dads, you're constantly teaching your children language, teaching them how to navigate this world, bringing your kids up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, dealing with hard questions. Dealing with hard questions is not just for the translator. It's for you too, as you read your Bibles. I mean, how many of you parents have had your kids ask you about circumcision when it comes up in their Bible reading? 
I imagine if you haven't already, some of your kids are going to ask after this service is over. You're going to need to get your Bible. And you're going to need to read it, study it, and pray, 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 pray for wisdom, pray for your kids, and praise the Lord for every ounce of understanding that he gives you or them. And as you do that, remember to pray for us as we try to become children once again to just communicate simply and clearly God's word in another language. Hopefully this this hour has overwhelmed you enough to pray for us, pray for our team as we translate. Uh, I'm working through the book of Ephesians, uh, about to finish chapter two. Uh, Amelia, even though she's not returning to PNG, she just got married, one of our teammates. Uh, She is helping with some translation projects, so be praying for her. She's in this as well. Um, Ryan is translating a bunch of materials, not into dough, but into Melanesian pigeon. Uh, Elna and Cassidy are constantly translating materials for literacy classes. Um, pray for, pray for them. Pray for Jeremy and Scott and Cameron. They're working to train future missionaries for this endeavor. Um, pray for us. I mean, we're all immersed in the wonder and the consternations of bringing truth from one language into another, and we need the Lord's help. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and that it is in our language. God, thank you that you are bringing your word into the Doe language and that we get to witness it. Um, God, may you get all the glory by our short lives and our weak efforts. And God, when we are weak, may we boast in that because your strength is going to shine all the more. God, I, I, I know how far short I fall of even the convictions I have mentioned. And my inadequacy to the task. Oh God, would you, be, would you be glorified? Would you make your word clear? Um, may uh, we all work with all our might to make you known, but may we not trust even the least in our works. May we trust you. God, thank you that this is your work and that you are the one who is in control. Amen.